Hello, welcome to Revision Tips for SIPS Level 4 Procurement and Supply Diploma. This is Module 1, Scope and Influence of Procurement and Supply. And we're going to cover Learning Outcome 2, which is to understand and analyse the key steps when procuring goods and services. So we'll look at the key aspects of the procurement cycle, the stages in the sourcing process, and we'll look at electronic systems that can be used at different stages and the relationship between compliance with the processes and achieving outcomes. So here you can see the SIPS procurement cycle. You can see it's got 13 different stages, which um, I would encourage you to have a look at on the SIPS website. But they're kind of broken down into three main sections. You've got the pre-award stages, stage one to eight, the contract award stage, which is stage nine, and then the things that happen after the contract award, the post award stages from 10 to 13. And clearly, if you're running a new procurement for the very first time, you're likely to, to need to go through all of these stages. Um, stage 13 would only be relevant to assets. But if you're rebuying something you've bought before or maybe just modifying the rebuy, then it might not need to go through every step. But it's helpful because it, you can see what you need to do and skip them if you don't think it's, it is relevant to that procurement. So like starting with stage one, identifying the need. But before we do that, a need can be um, tangible or intangible. And what we mean by that is something that's tangible is something physical, like a a particular item that you purchase um, and you can store it you can and it, it results in ownership so generally speaking um, it will be goods related procurements um, they will depreciate over time they'll either deteriorate or the the value will reduce over time um, and their costs can be easily determined Intangible ones are usually services, then there's no physical evidence of something that you've purchased. You can't put it in your pocket or put it on a shelf to, to use it at another time. Um, so they tend to be um, used and then there's, nothing, there's no ownership at the end of it. And the cost, therefore, is kind of a lot harder to determine on how, you know, how those intangible services are delivered. The needs, though, can come from an internal customer or an external customer but it's usually communicated to procurement by way of a requisition. That requisition will detail what's required, how many, when, and the quality that's needed. So in understanding the need, procurement might need to consult with the user to identify what priorities they require from the purchase. Moving on to stage two, the stage two is where the buyer determines whether the organisation should make the product themselves or buy it from an external supplier. And this is known as the make buy decision. And as you can see, you know, you would likely to buy it if um, you don't have the internal capacity or competence or um, it's not actually something that's very important to you. But if, it, if you do have the capacity and capabilities and it's a really important thing, then it's better to do it yourself, which is to make it. But if you're somewhere in the middle, you might need to have a decision um, about whether it's right to stay in or, or to go out. Moving on to stage three, this is where we develop a strategy or a plan. And this will outline the approach that you're going to take, whether that be locally, nationally or globally. It will include the evaluation of the competition, which you can do using Porter's Five Forces, which is the model you can see on the screen here. It basically analyzes the, the level of competitiveness in a market. It could be a buyer's market or a seller's market, depending on who has the power. If the seller has the power, it's usually a situation known as a monopoly. Whereas if the buyer has the power, it's perfect competition. Lots of buyers, lots of sellers. Um, so it's really important that you understand that before you develop your plan or strategy, because if there are one or just a couple of suppliers available to you, then it might be better to consider to negotiate rather than to run a competitive tender. Stage four um, in the pre-procurement market test. This means that you might need to engage with the market to establish how best to develop the specification. 
um, especially with the cost implica implement implications and optimum contracting terms, which might be whether the time is right to act upon that need, but also considering your product life cycle um, and the seasonal trends. So on the screen, you can see the product life cycle diagram. It goes through um, four stages. Um, there is a fifth one that comes occasionally, but the main four is a, a product is introduced. Um, it will go through a, an element of growth where you know you you see sales going up and it will uh, hit a plateau where it matures and you get stable stable customers um to the point where potentially it goes into decline because something else has come onto the market um to, to replace it um but at that point it possibly could get an extension you know there could be a another chance but um sometimes things make a comeback The next stage is to develop the appropriate documentation that you're going to send out to your suppliers. Now, you know, if you think back to the Porter's Forces model a couple of stages ago, if you know that you've got a large competitive market um, and you're, you know, you're more likely to issue a tender than, than to go down the quota or negotiation route. But here we're just going to compare the differences between a formal tender and a sort of informal quotation. But regardless if you pick an RFQ or an ITT, you should include a specification which gives the supplier an idea of what it is that you are expecting them to supply, the quantities, where the deliveries need to be delivered to or where the service needs to be uh, carried out, um, and a service level agreement about your expectations. So in the early to middle stages of the cycle, after the specification has been defined, you will then decide whether to issue that tender or quote. And the purpose of either of those is, of course, to communicate to the potential supplier what the requirements of your business is. But it also give a basis against which proposals can be assessed. So um, essentially an ITT is considered to be a lot more rigid and formal than an RFQ, which would also form the basis of a contract. Whereas an RFQ is fairly general request, which could lead to a direct purchase in terms which are favorable and where the circumstances allow for it. So they're often geared towards clients who are seeking a price improvement for a very clearly defined scope piece of work or materials invitations to tender, you know, high value complex products or services. Um, it's really formal uh, responses are in a set format and it's common in the public sector. Whereas quotes, yeah, okay, probably for standard regular items where price is more important. Um, more often in the private sector, I'd say you'd use quotes. So, the document that I mentioned that needs to go into your RFQ or ITT, um, one of the important ones is the specification. This sets out the requirements for the goods, services or works that you're buying. But there are two different types and it's important that you pick the right one. Um, so a spec can either be a performance based spec or a conformance based specification. The performance one focuses on the outcome. So it's on what needs to be achieved. So it leaves a bit of scope for interpretation, but also innovation, um, where it sort of talks about the what, not the how. So, for example, you might say, I need um, to have my offices cleaned every day um, and I need it to reach this standard, but you're not going to tell them how to do it. You, you're allowing them to perform to that, to that outcome, which gives them support you know a lot of flexibility and it's usually services um, the conformance one on the other hand focuses on the inputs so it'll look at things like the materials the color the size the weight the the brand name the, the make the model possibly it'll even give the methods of processes as well so ordinarily this will be quite specific manufacturers or components that you're asking for 
which ties them to deliver a certain item, you know, conformance is in you must conform to what we're asking for. The supplier has no room, there's no flexibility, there's no deviation, they have to provide what they, they've been asked to provide. Um, and it's usually seen in products, specifically pharmaceuticals. Another document that goes out of your tender is the KPI schedule, um, which is key performance indicator schedule, which is agreed measurements that will be included in the resulting contract. Buyers monitor suppliers' performance against them, and they should relate to the five rights of procurement, right quality, quantity, time, place, and price. But there shouldn't be too many included in the contract, otherwise, you know, the supplier doesn't know what's important to you. You should really measure what matters most. The five stages you go through to designing them is decide what matters and choose the measurement. That measurement can be a pass fail, a percentage or something qualitative. Then think about what information you're going to need to capture that data. Who's going to compile it, which should be the person that's got the easiest access to that data. And then the scoring and target setting, what does good look like and what's unacceptable? But no matter what, there must be smart objectives. So in other words, be specific, be able to measure them. They have to be achievable, relevant to the task or the strategy and time bound. So a well thought out KPI is fundamental ingredient to its performance management framework. But for many, developing a good KPI, one that actually drives the behavior to achieve this is actually much harder than it looks. So a well known saying I like is what, get, what gets measured gets managed or what get me gets measured gets done. And it's particularly true with contract management the KPIs will drive the supplier's behaviour. They know that's what you're going to be looking for. So it's really important that you align these to the, to the contract objectives. Good KPIs can reduce work, complaints and risks and encourage the supplier to focus on your contract's strategic objectives. Now, often what the KPI is hanging off the back of is a service level agreement, an SLA. This is essentially a contract between the service provider and its internal or external customers. And it documents what services the providers will furnish and the standards that the provider is obligated to meet. So it's silly things like um, response times. You know, if we place an order today before three o'clock, we expect it to be delivered next day. Additionally, you'll include um, draft terms and conditions when you're asking for your quotes and tenders because the supplier needs to understand what you're going to hold them to in terms of the, the terms, otherwise they won't really be able to price it properly without knowing that. So the contract terms are the written expressions of agreement between the buyer and the supplier. And to, to, what, to some extent, they just set out the obligations that each party has. I'd say the largest part of the contract is the buyer imposing obligations on the supplier. You'll do this by this date, at this price, blah, blah, blah. But there is actually an obligation on us as well. So one of the sort of obvious ones is the payment terms. We sign up to this and you know we, we tell the supplier they need to deliver next day and everything else. And when they don't hit that, we take the contract out the cupboard and we, we beat them over the head with it because they haven't complied with the terms of the contract but actually when it comes to us paying them on time we're not quite so good at you know always being in compliance you know complying with the contract terms so we must recognize that there are obligations on us as well and contracts are a two-way um, two-way communication in terms of the terms that sit in underneath that there'll be some general terms that form the main body of the contract they're not specific to the product or service so it could be things like you know start date end date um, it could be the term the duration what to do about if no if you need to serve notice and then there'll be a bunch of specific terms that relate precisely to the goods or services that you're purchasing um, but the terms themselves will either be expressed or implied 
the expressed ones are the ones that are clearly written in black and white within the contract because um, you can't argue with them that they're there they're expressly written implied terms not as easy because they're linked to legislation and regulations so even if they're not actually written as an expressed term they're assumed to exist so they don't have to be mentioned in the contract they're present even if they're not shown it's things like you know safety and health and safety and um, employee protection and all those sorts of things moving on to stage six this is the supplier selection stage um, an optional step of deciding which suppliers are going to receive the tender or the quote and Carter's 10 C's can be used at this stage so public sector organisations have very stringent policies and procedures to follow when seeking and evaluating suppliers. But private sector organisations are much less regulated and can adopt and evaluate many suppliers for a contract. But to gather and assess the suitability of a supplier, buyers must undertake things like site visits, conduct audits, ask them to, to um, complete a pre-qualification questionnaire, which most of Carter's 10 C's would um, capture the answers to or you can issue um, a request for information but have a think about what sort of information you might be looking for at that stage so it could be things like financial information it could be the extent to which they meet your um, CSR policies the reliability um, of their deliveries, their working conditions, capacity and possibly you know how they'll intend to price it. Is it a delivered price or is it X works or something along those lines? And then how will you um how is the best way to obtain that information? So I'd say Carter Sten Seas is a good framework to use as a starting point when you're looking at supplier appraisal because it provides some really useful criteria with which potential suppliers can be measured. Um, so it's widely used throughout the industry um, and actually a really useful learning tool within business courses as well. The whole essence of this is that it can be used in a flexible manner. So we've got 10 here, but you may actually think that only seven of them are relevant to you or four of them are critical to what you, 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 you're, um, you're trying to achieve. But let's go through what they are and let's explain them in a bit of detail. Competency, are they able to do the job required? Capacity, do they have sufficient resources for the size of the task? Do they have a commitment to things like quality management through ISO 9001? What is their control systems to illustrate their ability to consistently deliver? What's their cash position like? What's their financial stability? Consistency um, implies reliability and an ability to trust the supplier. Cost looks at that whole value for money approach. Culture looks at compatibility relating to whether the buyer and suppliers are linked and able to work together from a kind of values or strategic point of view. Clean or compliant will look for, I guess, their commitment towards um, the environmental agenda. So again, that can be easily demonstrated by having ISO um, 18001 or an environmentally, an EMS system, an environmental management system. And finally, communication is how far the supplier is communicative and provides the details required. But also, you know, it could be things like distance and language barriers and time zones and all sorts of things that potentially might cause you an operational constraint. But suppliers may not always welcome the appraisal. We spent time considering how very important they are to the buyer, but we must be aware that suppliers may not always welcome it. So it's important to build trust between the buyer and supplier um, so that they understand the, the advantages for both parties. So for example, they might be um, 
a particular supplier may not find the buyer's business very attractive. So the buyer will probably need to um, estimate the likely attractiveness of their business to the potential supplier before they invite them to, um, to, to be part of that um, pre-qualification. Suppliers may have a bad ex had a bad experience elsewhere, so make sure that it's a, a fair and transparent process. They might be unsure of the process, so provide as much information as you possibly can. The timing, the appraisal might be inconvenient, so try and you know allow adequate time, especially over sort of busy periods or periods of holidays like summer, Easter, Christmas, um, and so on. They may believe that the, uh, the process can be expensive and time consuming, so ensure that the exercise is streamlined as much as you can. And they may be wary of sharing confidential information, so you might need to overcome that by using a um, confidentiality or an NDA. Okay, moving on to stage seven. This is the point where you'll issue your tender or your quote. In the tender process, all documents should be sent to the potential suppliers at the same time. And that's to allow, you know, fairness and transparency. You don't want to give somebody an extra few days that you haven't given to somebody else. Um, the four stages in your tender process is to firstly prepare everything before it goes out. So all the documents we spoke about, such as the specification, the KPIs, the contract terms. The process is the, the point where you actually issue that to the market and deal with any questions and answers. Then you need to evaluate um, before you can move into the award stage. Stage eight looks at the actual quotation um, or tender evaluation. So linking back to the third stage of the previous slide and cross-functional teams are often involved in evaluating tenders and that's to make sure that the process is fair and impartial. Now quotes um, are often less formal and decisions are made much faster with less involvement from anybody else, but um, it's important to consider the total cost of ownership when you're evaluating tenders um, and quotes rather than just the, just the price, especially when a capital asset is being purchased. So here you can see an example of a um, tender evaluation methodology. So once the tenders are received, careful process of assessment must be undertaken to identify your preferred supplier. Now historically assessment of tenders might simply have been the lowest compliant bid um, and this you know still may be appropriate for very simple supply contracts but for some it may not result in the best value tender being selected and there's a tendency under such systems for tenderers to submit low prices and then to find a way to change it once the contract has been secured. So um, assessments that identify the tender that best meets the client's needs and offer, offer is looking for a more value for money approach uh, and sometimes referred to as most economically advantageous tender as opposed to just looking for the lowest price. And these scores will be given to the written responses that a tenderer will provide um, and that, that will be worth a, a percentage of the overall score which it's more about what you get for your money rather than the lowest price. It's a different approach. Stage nine is the contract award and implementation. So once the awarding supplier has agreed to accept the contract, the contract is signed. You also need to um, notify the unsuccessful bidders. Um, and if the existing supplier is being replaced, you must make sure the supply is continuous and the contract is transferred from the incumbent to the new supplier in a, you know, well-managed fashion. Now, contract implementation will consist of two distinct phases. You've got the migration, which is the facilitation of the movement of organisation to a new contract post go live, and the mobilisation, which is the process of moving it from the contract award to the go live state. So the mobilization process um, is a guide to help plan activities between the contract award and the go live. And the timescales for each stage should be amended to reflect your own specific procurement expertise. Stage 10, warehousing, logistics and receipt. 
So advising the relevant teams when to expect the new goods so that the warehouse can be prepared to receive and store inventory and that logistics can make the necessary arrangements. Lu Dong Zing is Chinese for flowing or fluidity. This is the essential aspect of warehousing, receipting and dispatch. It's on the bottom left hand side of this screen. The flow of goods must be considered from initial arrival to the final exit. And to this end, the design of a warehouse must encompass the mass and velocity of the goods moving through the facility. So considerations such as quality and quantity need to be considered, but also the packaging and the use of barcoding, which can help as well. The barcoding helps to identify individual products, groups of products, the content of a purchase order, batch numbers, producer details, the routing for the delivery, the production and the sell by dates, unique items, but also the arrival and departure points. And as well as the advantages of identified, all the identified um, advantages that I've listed, barcodes also eliminate human error, which reduces the need for training on descriptions and provides a versatile identification system with rapid data and improved decision making. Stage 11, the contract performance review. So setting up periodical meetings with your supplier to review their progress against the KPI is specified in the contract and will be used to address any underperformance. Performance measurements to uncover all aspects of the contract should be designed to suit the requirement for that particular contract and should be set out in the contract documentation to ensure suppliers are fully aware of both the measures and the, and the measurement technology and methodology before any contract is awarded. It's important that the performance measures um, provide clear and de demonstrable experience and evidence of the success of otherwise of the relationship and the principles such as cost and value obtained, customer satisfaction, improved delivery and added value, delivery capability, any benefits that have been realised and the relationship strength and responsiveness. Now contract management is operational, but supplier relationship management on the other hand is about relationships. Now both of these evaluate and monitor the supplier and their performance against the contract, but not all contracts need to be proactively managed, only the most important ones and contracts and supplier management are influenced by how important the contract is. And you can know, you can identify this with the Crowdjick matrix, which you can see an example of on the screen. High risk, high impact, um, high profit impact as well, um, will be in your top right hand corner strategic box. That's where most of your attention needs to go. And to be fair, it's probably where 80% of your spend is. You've got some bottlenecks, probably monopoly providers. Again, you need to keep an eye on them because you need them. Um, the risk is high, but you don't spend huge amounts of money and there's not much competition out there. Leverage is probably your one off spot buys of expensive equipment that you would leverage your position in the market. Um, so fairly low risk and your non criticals are your sort of office supplies and such that you just want to bundle them together because you don't want to spend too much time focusing attention of your contract and supplier relationship manager on those. In fact, it's better to focus it on the right hand side of this model. So the crowdjet matrix can be used to determine what sort of relationship is required at each with each supplier. So let's look at the characteristics of either a collaborative or a distributive relationship. Collaborative style is used in the used if the supplier is strategic to your organization. Whereas distributive style is used for short term contracts or for needs that are not core to an organization.
stage 13, which is the um, asset management one. So it's only relevant if you've purchased um, an asset. So reviewing the contract that's in place, you'll check to see if it still meets the needs of the organisation. But decommissioning or removing an asset will come when it's at the end of its life. So have a think about at least five suppliers your organisation works with. Plot them onto a, a crowdjet matrix and then determine whether the relationship with that supplier needs to be strategic. The next is to analyse the key stages of the sourcing process. So we're going to look at value, value added that's provided at each of these stages. So firstly, defining the need. This is about developing the specifications for what will be sourced and considering what the buying organisation needs from the supplier. Then the creation of contract terms and developing those terms and conditions and other legal requirements of the bidders. These elements can set out the terms that an organisation and supplier will agree to when they enter into a contract. The supplier selection is about finding the most suitable supplier to work with and also to reduce the amount of risk that you're exposed to. Contract award, once all the bids have been received, the proposals are evaluated and scored against some weighted criteria. The contract will be offered to the most suitable supplier. And then the contract and supplier management. This is about evaluating and monitoring the suppliers and their performance against the contract. Now, electronic systems can be used at different stages in that sourcing process. The E at the start just means the process is being carried out electronically. But from a conceptual perspective, e-procurement is very simple to the classic tendering process. It helps companies source what the inputs and the products and services at the lowest possible cost, but also while ensuring that those inputs meet technical and other specifications. The process of an e-procurement incorporates two, the e-requisition and the e-sourcing. The first refers to the purchase of goods and services by the end user, whereas sourcing emphasises the negotiation between the company and its suppliers. So we've got e-sourcing. We can develop the e-spec, send out ERFQs, EITTs, negotiate via email or even use reverse auctions, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, but where a supplier reduces their bid, nobody will go any lower. So prepare and send an e-contract and do some supplier evaluation using this software. E-requisition uses technology to raise a requisition and send it to procurement. This reduces the amount of time an individual is removed from their core activity. There's a lower chance of the electronic document getting lost than the paper-based one. And it does provide full traceability of who raised the requisition, who it was sent to and when. So it ends up with a much higher level of control. Catalogues are up to date and displayed by a supplier for their product range. And that's available on the internet or on a website. Buyers may need to refer to e-catalogues to help them source the need. And it can save procurement professionals time because the information is readily available. And that's rather than having to look and wait for paper-based copies to be delivered. It can be easily searched using technology rather than manually locating the items. And clearly there's an option to compare things side by side. But also a really good point about e-catalogues is it reduces the environmental impact since there's no need to produce these massive paper-based catalogues anymore. E-ordering is the use of electronic systems to place orders. And that can go manually or automated. 
manually somebody's physically inputting the the order whereas a, an automated one would be coming from MRP materials requirement planning system because it knows that you're going to sell so many and it understands that you're going to need to buy certain materials to make that happen and then you've got the e-payment technologies allowing for the funds to transfer from one to the other and the bank de uh, bank transfers are often used to pay invoices directly into the supplier's bank account but you can use debit cards as well for low risk goods and services over the counter So I said I'd come back to reverse auction. The reverse auction is a type of auction in which the traditional role of the buyer and seller are reversed. So there's one buyer and possibly many sellers. In an ordinary auction, buyers compete to obtain the goods and services. So in contrast, in a reverse auction, the seller competes to obtain the business from the buyer. And the prices will typically decrease as the seller underbids each other. And they're held online, so they're much quicker and easy to compare, compare bids. Suppliers can communicate, it translates it into its local language, there's no geographical constraints. Um, I suppose lower overheads for the supplier as well, because there's no, no need to visit. Um, but the downside is that supplier could make a low, lower profit than they would have done if they'd have gone down a different route. And without samples being tested suppliers can't really be bidding on something that's not suitable so the p2p process is a coordinated um, and integrate integrated action plan taken to fulfill a requirement for goods and services in a timely manner at a reasonable price it involves a number of sequential stages ranging from the identification of the need to invoice approval and vendor payments and it steps up in a procure to pay cycle which is needed to execute in strict order. All right, we're now gonna look at um, the relationship between achieving compliance with processes and achieving outcomes. So, the process is there to help ensure consistency, transparency and compliance with, it, with the procurement department. Um, it will instruct buyers on what they need to do um, and so that tenders are evaluated in, in the same way. Um, it does reduce the risk by providing guidelines for decision making which will aid with compliance as well. And it ultimately saves the buying organisation time and money um, making them more efficient. We'll advise the buyer on how to conduct themselves when representing the organisation and the procurement profession in general. And it will help the procurement professional identify the type of suppliers they should engage with and those that should be avoided on the basis of their ethics, sustainability and corporate social responsibility policy. So the factors that we might make checks on are things like credit rating scores or considering the market in which the buying organisation trades and, other, and, and talking to representatives from the supplying organisation to get an understanding of their culture. Processes relating to the ethics that protect the organisation can be done by educating the procurement team in what to be aware of when poor practices should present themselves. But achieving compliance with processes contributes to achieving outcomes, such as complying with CSR standards and with national and international regulations and legislation, reducing risk, and making sure that the activities you undertake are in line with your organisation's strategy. And when these processes are complied with, it will result in added value. But not complying with them could result in an organisation experiencing things like unethical behaviour, working with unsuitable suppliers, product shortages, damages to reputation, 
and even legal action in some cases. So in today's socially conscious environment, employees and customers place a premium on working for and spending their money with businesses that prioritise corporate social responsibility. So this CSR is an evolving business practice that incorporates sustainable development into a company's business model. It has a positive impact on social, economic and environmental factors. Thank you for watching.